me just see. Hi, my name is Carol Williams with Strategic Decision Solutions, and I have with me Hans Lasso. Hans? Hi, um, my name is Hans Lasso. I'm today heading up the Actus Risk Advisory. Actus is an odd name, but it's a merge between the Danish two words of active uncertainty, because my company is founded on the basis that uncertainties, risks, levers, whatever, they're here to stay. So instead of being worried and wanting to mitigate the whole thing, we might as well learn how to use it and leverage as, as, as a strategic advantage. Well, thank you so much for joining me today um, in our very interesting topic of quantification of risk. Um, it's a very, uh, seems to be a very controversial topic in the world of risk management because so many people get very comfortable in their qualitative ways of doing risk management. And we want to be able to get people out of that comfort zone, recognizing that it can be doable to get to measuring risk. So um, so thank you for joining me today to talk about that. Sure. And I think so, that's a great, it's a great topic because, yes, uh, qualitative assessments are easy to make. And you may feel confident by doing that, but that's the confidence of ignorance. And it comes down to bias, right? Because we all have and, our biases. And then, it's we biased, to... and then it's wrong and then it's dangerous. Yes, uh, but you can always excuse it afterwards and say, oh, we couldn't have known. Um, well, yes, you could. Well, and the other part comes down to we're making decisions as part of the result of the assessments that we're doing. Yeah. And our decisions are only as good as the information going into it. And so if you want to have a good decision, you need to have good information. And that comes down to you have to make the, the information as unbiased as possible, which typically takes you back to data, um, as long as you have the data in the right context, right? Yes. And not skewing it for the purpose. Um, right. Yeah, that's always the key part here. So, as, a, as opposed to the very bad executive who makes a stupid decision and asks a project manager to implement it, and when the project manager fails, it's a project manager's fault. Right. Yeah, that's always a frustration um, because it's kind of going down to, um, and I was working on something yesterday talking about uh, decision quality and mm -hmm. how your decision quality is based on your experiences because you, you're using... Uh, different inputs and things. And so as you're working through that, you are um, looking at your experiences and what you've got, but you can't judge a decision based on the outcome because sure. you don't know what the outcome is going to be at the time that you make the decision. So you have to judge the decision based on the information that is available at the time you make the decision. Um, sure. But a lot of people think that we are making good decisions when in reality, we're not. Right. So. How can if we you and I both bought a book, If you and I both bought a lottery ticket, I won, you didn't. You have made the better decision because your private finances are better than mine, which means that the sacrifice I've made was bigger than yours. And that's the only thing we knew when we made the decision. And then I was lucky, you were not. That has nothing to do with the decision. Correct. Yep. Completely agree. Um, it's separating those two mm -hmm. of the decision versus the outcome. So as we talk about things to, as an input into a decision, you've got um, being able to measure things. Um, one of the books that frequently uh, gets referenced is um, Douglas Hubbard. So tell me, because uh, I know you and I have talked about it a lot, um, Tell me what drew you to uh, Douglas Hubbard. And I know he's got two books that are very well known. Um, so tell me what what drew you to uh, to Douglas Hubbard. Um, actually, it's several years ago. I had re only recently started risk man doing risk management. And I was looking into using a heat map and asking people whether this was low and high because I didn't know better and what is that and to get some kind of frame around it. Then one of the consultants I was not working with, but he was in the building anyway for another project. He said, ah, before you go along too far along way, this that way, there's a book called The Failure of Risk Management. You should actually read that. And uh, I said, do you think so? Absolutely. So I went on Amazon, I bought the book and I read it. And um, that was 
kind of inspiring because there was a lot of the, should we say, assumptions about risk management that I that got totally shot down. And at the same time, I had a discussion with my CFO. Uh, he's a former, he was a former banker. And he had this thing about if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. And bye-bye goes any idea of qualitative risk assessments. If you can't measure it, can't manage it. So I want a metric, I want a measurement. How do you do it? Um, and Douglas Huppert said the same thing. And based on his reference to the other book, How to Measure Anything, I read that as well because he referenced it so many times. And I thought, hey, maybe a good idea. And those were, should we say, some of the basic building blocks of the tech, uh, the approach, uh, the methodology I applied when I started out uh, doing risk management at the Lego Group and then yeah, build on, on that one. And so how to measure anything is really for any industry. It's very industry agnostic, yes. very um, basic from a, if even if you're not an engineer, you know, you're right. engineer by training, right? Mm -hmm. So math comes a little bit easier to you than to a lot of other people. So um, do you think that how to measure anything um, is a good book for even people who are not comfortable with numbers? Yes. Absolutely, because it gives them an idea about, it gives them two things. One is that, no, it's not everything is financial. How to measure every, anything is going way beyond um, dollar numbers uh, and looking at numbers for anything. That's one thing. The other thing is it documents through a series of examples that you can easily recognize that you have more data than you think and you need less data than you think. Which is a lot of help because you, it makes it a lot less complex. And then he talks about the value of information where you take, yes, you can make a perfect model, unless you can make the absolutely correct statistical uh, distribution of your outcome range, which is very difficult and we spent months doing it. We could also have jumpstart and make a simple triangular uh, distribution and lo and behold, the decision that came out of it is the same. So all the efforts we've made to be absolutely certain we're right is actually void. This is a waste of effort. And we have to, we don't have to be perfect. We just have to be good enough to make the best possible decision. Do you want guarantees? Well, Buy a toaster. Well, and that kind of comes back to that idea of um, you only need about 80% of the information to be able to make a decision. You have to you have to decide at what point is good enough. When do you feel like you have the information that you need to make the decision without mm -hmm. feeling like it has to be every single bit of information on this topic for you to be able to make a decision at what point this is good enough? Yes. Right? One of the one of the fun tests you can do is say, say you have 10 data points that you've collected. You have 10 data points. And you can figure out what would be might be my decision. It'll be option A. Okay. Now you try just for the fun of it to add three data points which are in either one of the extremes of your data, not both of them, just one of them. And then you recalculate. Would you still choose option A? Yes, I would. Okay. So there was no then value in the added you don't data. Have to be then you don't have to be worried that you don't have 500 sets of data. Yeah, if that's a great to... point because a lot of people just want, if I can just get this one other piece of information. Um, yeah. And I, I phrase that as analysis paralysis. People get so locked in on that. Mm -hmm. We just need to analyze the, analyze the information. Let's truly dig deep and understand this problem um, and things like that. And you literally just get paralyzed and stuck. Sure. Um, one of one of Doc's examples is uh, you have to guess the um, guess the range of the weight of M and M's. Very simple. And then you guess a range. Now you get three M and M's, and get to weigh them. How much narrower can you get on the range? They're not that different. So you get to weigh the three and see, okay, the range is actually that narrow, not this wide. So you have a lot of information out of three data points. And then there's, of course, he, he does have a lot of supporting statistics uh, that, that goes in and you can read it and you can understand half of it and understand the gist of the other, the other half 
and then you can go on going if you're not comfortable with numbers. But um, largely, if you're not comfortable with numbers, what are you doing in risk management? Well, because be a lot of people believe that risk management is not a numbers field, right? So they go into it or they start out from a, um, you know, an operational view and they're being asked to talk about risk and things like that. And they end up kind of coming into it. So the mm -hmm. numbers may not be in their background. They may no. understand understand risk from an operational side, but how can we right. get them into being comfortable with it, yes. right, um, is what it comes down to. Um, now, I know that the How to Measure Anything book, they also sell like a workbook for it, for people to be able to actually do the exercises. Yes. Do you think that that would be a good way for people to get comfortable is yes. to buy the workbook? Yes, it will do two things for them. One is they give them hands-on, minds-on training directly when they just read the book and do the exercises. The other one is it will demonstrate how um, susceptible they are to the biases that he also talks about. Um, how right, right are you when, you sh when you're when you certain? And for most, most people, you're less right than you think when you're guessing. People are horrible at guessing. Daniel Kahneman had it very nicely put that people has it with thinking the same way cats has it with swimming. They can do it, but they definitely prefer not to. And that's what he calls system one and system two thinking. We like to park everything in system one because it's fast, intuitive, and not energy consuming. System two takes energy and time, and we hate it. Well, and that's part of the reason why, like, when you think about all of the uh, guessing games of how many jelly beans do you think are in this jar? And you can have people that range all the way from 150 to 5,000 because mm -hmm. we're bad at guessing. Like, yes. you shouldn't be able to guess that big of a range for the same jar. Like, nothing changes right. in that right. circumstance, and yet the ranges are huge, right? In, in both books, Hoppet has a game about uh, confidence bias where he asks you 10 rather silly questions. And you're supposed to come up with a range where you're 90% certain the real answer is. And uh, I've done this a number of times in different sessions and I will be doing it again because it's a good game to highlight your confidence bias. Even when you don't know, you don't know the answer. 80, most of the people, by far most of the people will have eight, eight or nine out of 10 questions out of range. They should have nine, eight, nine, or ten within range, and I have yet to see anybody who hits eight. Just a single one. Well, I mean, that just goes to show that while we think that we know a lot of things, that we really don't. Um, right. And we we use two narrow ranges. One of the questions uh, I use a lot is uh, Martin Luther King was killed in nineteen sixty eight. How old was he? Most common guesses between forty and sixty. The dude was 39. Sorry, guys. He was 36 when he said I had a dream. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, it's... um, And they get, got that wrong. What's the length of the River Nile? What's the... And so forth. And, and people would guess it totally wrong. And that's why it's important. But then again, if you take three or four people, put them together and take, discuss it, and then take the range that you can agree upon, then you will have most of them. So the way around it is group discussions, not 50 people, three or four people with preferably with different backgrounds having to discuss how big could this risk be if we're really unlucky? How small will it be if we're lucky? What do we expect? The ranges they will come up with, the numbers they will come up with, will be a heck of a lot more precise than if we just ask one, one person. And so that actually goes to a really good topic around when it comes to risk assessments. Mm -hmm. um, if if you don't have data readily available and you need to come up with an answer, right? Because sometimes you have to make decisions immediately. Um, getting together that small group to talk it through with those different perspectives is much better than thinking, I just need to go off into a room and make the decision on my own. Right. And having this small group talk it through is actually always a good idea. Because I can tell you one thing, you will never, ever, ever have the data you need. Because all of your risk taking is in the future and you don't have data about the future. You have data about the past and then you can extrapolate. 
but <laughs> you can extrapolate the safety of the US and doing great until September 11th. Yeah. You can do great on European safety until February 22nd this year. You can do great on oil prices, uh, on on financials until the financial crisis in, in 2008. I mean, <clears throat> these things will happen. And then your all of your uh, extrapolation goes totally sour. So you have to have people with insights looking at the data and see, okay, this is the trend. What could drive it to be wider, to go one direction or the other, other direction? Um, one approach could be what I would call or have been told, been taught to be called, called the Italian flag method. The Italian flag is red, white, and green. And uh, you can then say, okay, which arguments do I have that this number will go down? These are the reds. Which arguments do I have that will go up? These are the greens. Which are neutral or undecided? These are the white ones. And once you have a number of arguments there, then this group can talk about, okay, what do we believe? Does it go up or should we say, okay, it has an upside tail. It has a downside tail or the whole average is moving. What, what do we believe based on that? And then you have an intelligent discussion that will frame it. And I guarantee it will be much more precise than what you can come up with. And precision is not necessary. Absolute precision is not the target. It's the target to get good enough precise enough to drive right. the model that will give you the right answer to give the right decision or the answer yeah. to prone the right decision. So it sounds like maybe the, the key phrase for this whole conversation is the data needs to be good enough. Yes. It's really what it comes down to. It right. just needs to be good enough. Yes. Um, so with all of this data and the, and, or the lack thereof, since we're talking future, what data can companies uh, look to to help guide their their risk assessments depends on what the risk is i mean there will be different data for different risks um you can take a look at uh, your employee motivation and satisfaction what is the rate of people voluntarily leaving the company going up or down how many people do you have who are sick with stress going up or down? What's that compared to industry standard? Then, of course, you can measure, ask people about their motivation and satisfaction. That's another one. But you still have these indicators. What about reputation? For traded companies, it's easy. Look at your market cap. Look at your stock prices. If investors believe your company is doing well, the stock prices will go up. If they think they are doing poorly or you're in trouble, then it'll go down. And those guys are anxious and nervous lemmings. They will react right now, right here, with 10 minutes on something that will happen five years from now. Yeah. So it sounds almost as if uh, you're suggesting that they use performance metrics that the company's already using, um, exactly. or at least look at those as the, as the starting point. Um, oh, and maybe there's gaps. They, use, they don't think it, I probably shouldn't do anything else than using different performance metrics, knowing that a company has a thousand one performance metrics. I mean, they will have productivity and uh, other stuff in operations. They will have uh, sales visits and sales and they will have all kinds of things. They will have tons of operation of, of um, metrics on different levels of performance throughout the company. And use those, don't invent anything else. Don't do anything for the sake of risk management embedded in the way you manage a company. Now, assuming that company that I think the assumption that people have or that companies have hundreds of performance metrics, I think it's assuming the company is at a certain place in their operations and their mm -hmm. maturity. Um, I think there's going to be a lot of organizations, especially for people who are watching this, that maybe work for organizations that don't have that um, plethora of performance metrics to choose from. Um, I know of companies that are working to build out. Uh, performance metrics and really know like what exactly are the right metrics for us to be looking at um, or they've got way too many and they so they get lost right and they really need to hone it down so um, but I definitely hear what you're saying around if they already use the data harness that for risk as well right yes. now, 
I guess most of the companies, even those who say they don't have the performance data, um, those data will be known. You can go all the way down to first level managers. How do you measure the productivity of your team? How do you see who's good and who's not? They will have data for that. It's not officially recorded in an IT system and reported to the board of directors. That doesn't mean it does not data. So but that is true. Like the raw data those. will be there. I mean, even entrepreneurial companies where you have one guy in charge and five people working for him, they will have data on how many customers do we have? How many orders do we have? What's in our books? What's our... Uh, uh, liquidity and stuff like that, and the banks will help them on that. So yes, you have tons of data. And if you have like a company like the entrepreneurial company and you're going out and you're developing that building, that industry, maybe environmental data is not the most relevant. But then again, you may not have an environmental target. You may not have an aspiration to be the greenest entrepreneur in the country or something like that. If you do, you'll probably start measuring it. But what is not considered important performance to you, you won't measure. But then again, if you don't measure, it's not a risk. It's not at risk. So that's another good key takeaway, though, is that if you don't measure it, then there really isn't a risk because it's not important. No, right. Then it's not at risk. So I think that's a good um, aha moment, I think, for people watching this because a lot of times um, people feel like they've identified this brand new risk yet there's no data to support um, to support it so they go oh well, we need to go find the data or we need to go figure out how we need to start capturing this data but yeah. th is that really necessary right. I think that that needs to be like a, a gut check and right that on habit, that habit help, helps you be doing that as well this risk has happened. There's a, um, a war between L Libya and Israel. Liberia, uh, yeah, Libya and Israel, whatever. <clears throat> Can you see that? Uh, you, you know what's happened, yes. Can you see that in your performance metric? No. Does it affect your sales, your vendors, your market, your pricing, your costing, your HR? Your... Nope. Okay. Why do you think this is a risk to you? It is a risk to the people of Israel and Libya, true. And to a lot of companies trading with them, true. Is it a risk to you? No. And you can look at all of this. Uh, and when you say you don't have data, Doc has a, a brilliant way of asking about this. I say, okay, you say you don't have data for it. How do you know it has happened? And if you can't tell it, and if you can tell it has happened, how do you measure that? How can you tell? I mean, which piece of data gives you the idea? Okay, then you have your measurement. Is that, but that doesn't mean anything to us. Okay, then it's not a risk to you right now. But you can still, you still have this indicator that hey, it happened. It happened. So here's a, um, a question. If we're going to go back and use performance metrics, data that's yeah. already being captured a lot of people if we're going to start utilizing that for risk purposes they figure oh well it's no longer a kpr now we need to make it a kri yeah what, what are your feelings on that i hate the term K, kri and that's <laughs> tell me why <laughs> my perception my perception differs what's the purpose of risk management is it to manage risk nope it's to enhance performance and when it's about enhancing performance, it's not about key risk. I mean, the minute you say key risk indicators, you are taking it out of the performance and taking it out of management of the business and putting it over here in a silo where you don't need it to be. It's the performance metric. And look at that and say, OK, are we still doing OK? Are we still happy with the results that we're getting? Nope. OK, what's happening? What are we going to do about it? It's not about now we're doing risk management for risk management's sake. Um, I've used the term that this is my performance handle, this is my risk hand. And if I do risk management, I look like this and say, okay, I'm looking at it. I can see my performance hand over here, but it's somewhat blurry. All the executives are looking at the performance hand because they're paid to look at the do the performance. They can see the risk, but it's not it's somewhat blurry. And what you're gonna do is being a good Catholic and fold your hands because Risk and opportunity, risks and performances are totally interlinked. You cannot possibly 
in the real world and in the VUCA world that we're talking about now, talk about one without talking about the other. There is no game without taking risks. I agree. And that's why you have to fold your hands and put them together. And instead of inventing a lot of risk indicators that will affect your performance, look at the performance indicators and see how they're affected. So basically the, the, the phrase of a key risk in, indicator just needs to be pushed to the side, forget about it, forget you hear about it, because we need to keep it into the context of performance. Yes. Because that is it's, what that um, is. Key risk indicator is a an unnecessary added, should we say, professional term for risk managers that they really don't need, just like uh, uh, inherent risk. It's a stupid thing I've ever heard about. Um, <laughs> How big is this risk if we didn't do anything about it? Who cares? <laughs> I mean, how big is my risk of being run over if I cross the street without looking for traffic? I wouldn't do that, so who cares? It's probably so, high. That doesn't make I'm taking the risk. It's not a practical question no. to ask. No. Yeah, so I'm going to give you a little story from back when I first started practicing ERM because I didn't know better at that point about mm -hmm. inherent versus residual. And I was trying to teach the business about what is inherent risk and how they need to think about it. And I was talking to our information security people and they were like, so you want me to try to assess the risk without us doing the basic things that information security does called firewalls and having passwords and all these different things. They're like, I can't think that way because that's just the way that it is. Yes. So why do you want us to try to assess the risk? Yes. Taking in, taking out all the things that we typically do anyway. Right. What's the risk of your car being stolen if you put it in a large parking lot for 24 hours with the keys in the ignition? Uh, that would be rather stupid. Yes, but that would be the inherent risk of your car getting stolen if you didn't do anything. Um, it's it's a risk. to me. There's only one risk: the current risk that you're exactly. looking at. What's your current position? And then, if you're unhappy with that, you can start looking at if we add this and this and that control and mitigating action, then we can get to a potential to a new status which we may like better, but it could be too expensive or whatnot. And then we can move into that. And then this becomes a current. It's only the current that matters. The Agree. Real. Agree. Um, no, that's great. And <laughs> I'm, I'm chuckling going back into memory lane. So that was pretty funny. Um, <laughs> so there are people who will claim, I don't have any data. So how do you work with those people to make them realize you do have data to be able to use for assessing risks. Going back to Doug Hubbard, how do you know it's happened? You have this risk. How do you know it has happened? It has happened. Oh, but I can see that it's happening over there. Yeah, but how can how does that affect your company? How can you see on your company performance that this has actually happened? And there are two answers. I can see it this way. Okay, now you have the data. Or I can't see it. Now it's not a risk. Okay, you pick your choice. If it's a risk to you, you can see that it has happened. Oil prices right. go up. You can see that it has happened. Then it's a risk. Okay, fine. How do you know? Well, oil, my oil prices went up. Okay, so you can measure your oil prices. Oh, my reputation went down. Oh, you can see your stock prices went down. Or you're not getting as many applicants for new job, for positions as you used to do. Or why not? I mean, there could be tons of different ways of doing this. But just ask yourself, how do you know it has actually happened? Okay. All right. So, guys, have you heard it? So if you don't have any data, you can't measure. If you can't measure a data, you can't manage the risk, right? So if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. And if you have people that feel like they say that there's no data, you just need to ask, how are you going to know if it happens? Um, and that basically tells you whether or not they actually do have data or they don't. What would what would be the third takeaway, that, uh, Hans, that you feel like we need to uh, make sure people remember from this conversation? Use the smart people you have in the company. Always talk to people. Not one, teams of two, three, four, or five people, preferably with different perspectives. 
If you're looking at a market risk, have some product developers, some marketing people, have some operational people, a logistics guy, maybe a finance, whatever. Have a group of people with different perspectives discuss the same thing and see how big is this. These people will, with a different, if they don't, if you don't have any physical data as such, and sometimes you won't, then it doesn't really matter because you will have the insights of these people. And when they talk, they will talk about, well, what's a likely scenario? And they will be able to describe a likely scenario of if this risk happens. And then they will see, okay, what's the best case and what's the worst case? And now you have a distribution that you can apply in a Monte Carlo simulation and manage the risks professionally. Um, and you don't have to put it in a heat map. By the way, you can't put a distribution into a heat map anyway. So um, now, you can now you can manage the risk and consolidate it with others and so forth, and you're good to go. And in a lot of instances, once you get the data, you can have risks that people are very, very worried about. And I'll get back to that in a second. But they appear to be not very important. And I can take, I, US citizens are fun in this direction. There's an analysis made that says that 15% uh, of the US population is worried about being hit by a terrorist attack. 15%. Less than 0.1% of US citizens know somebody who has been hit by a terrorist attack over the past 20 years. Less than 0.1%. You're still worried. Almost every American knows somebody who has been uh, seriously wounded or killed in traffic. 10% of Americans are worried about traffic safety. How does that compute? I mean, you all, you, you kill people left, right, and center. 9-11 cost 3,300 people their lives. That was the same number of people you lost in traffic for the, in the month of September and October and November and December and going on and on and on. How can it, people's perception are not necessarily valid? So having working around those and having different perceptions into it and come back to say, this is actually it. And these are important, these are less important. That's the, to me, the key takeaway. Leverage the people you have. They are much smarter. And one of the lessons I learned as a manager is that the more you listen to people, the smarter they become. And the smarter you become as well, because you start yeah, listening and gaining and, yes. and taking all of that knowledge. Yes. Um, and you become more dangerous the more knowledge you have. <laughs> but yes, it don't helps. Want to in... If you think knowledge is power and you don't want to share, yes. But we should always be sharing our knowledge with the organization. That's the whole purpose of our role is yeah. to go back to the decision making. And we want to improve the decision making by our leaders um, of the company. Yeah. So it, it, it's a side step, but that should be one of the uh, key tasks for HR for people on the com in the company is how do we ensure organizational know how? How do we make sure that people share the organization, share the insights they have? So if you leave the company, we are not sitting there with a void because you are sitting on a lot of knowledge that you wouldn't share with anybody. And suddenly we don't have it anymore. The company should never be in that position. Learn to share. All right, but I guys. know in some very competitive companies, and I've been talking to one of them. I was in a network with one of them. They were extremely competitive. There was one thing you never did, and that was ask. Because if you asked, you told, told other people, say, you were weak, you didn't have the information. And nobody would ever tell you, because if you needed my information, I have the power over you, and I'm not going to give it to you. Um, needless to say, the company was not doing very well. So that doesn't sound like a very good company to want to perform but, well. But they were extremely um, competitive. Yeah. Not com competing, competing. And they have completely forgotten that the enemy is outside of the room. Not inside the room with you. Not inside the room. Yep. Well, um, so with this interview, I'm going to be posting a link to Decide to Succeed for people mm -hmm. uh, to be able to buy your book because you do talk about um, these conversations and how to have these conversations with people. Um, we'll also post the links for Douglas Hubbard's um, The Failure of Risk Management and How to Measure Anything along with the workbook uh, so that people can really start taking those um, 
pieces of information that uh, you guys have been so great to write up for everybody else to share share that knowledge um, and share the wealth with everybody else. So thank you very much, Hans. Okay. Fun doing. <laughs>